All right, we're, I'm going to go ahead and get started, and um, those who come in late can obviously backtrack if they want to. Um, we're down here at week nine, and we had finished up with pivot tables, and we'd worked ahead, and that was uh, Excel case 13. And we talked about uh, pivot tables as a prelude to working with databases. Now, on Tuesday, I went over just some basic concepts for relational databases and using uh, Northwind Traders, which is a template or an example that Microsoft Office has, and tried to make, make the point, I hope, that when you talk about dashboards, and, you'll hear, and you're going to hear that throughout your career, and you're going to use them, at the heart of it is a database system. Databases are, are, are so obsequious now, we use them in so many different ways that it's kind of difficult to break it out and, and, and take a look at it as something kind of separate from our, our computing experiences and our digital life. But they're the, they're the lifeblood of all that we're able to do. And that is because they essentially are a tool that we can use to, pardon me, to collect, to store and to retrieve data. And with the advent of the internet, with the advent of, of high speed computing, we're able to, to handle and grab unprecedented amounts of data that are out there. And companies that leverage that are gonna be the ones that are gonna be the winners and they simply leveraging the law of, of, of large numbers. So we're gonna get a, a little bit of an introduction to databases and we're gonna use Microsoft Excel. And basically, again, this is the same principle when we talked about using uh, Microsoft Access, excuse me. It's the same process as when we talked about using Excel. Once you understand the template, that is you understand, for example, like the bar system, then with the tree system to search for different functions and do different things, formatting, et cetera. Once you understand that we use spreadsheets to take data and analyze them, and then also to try to visualize them, that's a far step ahead. But the place where we get the data to do our work comes from databases because that's what they're intended to do. And I've talked, uh, spoken about some hybrid products that are out there. Tableau is one of them. SAS Visual Analytics is another where we try to marry the, the best of both worlds of a relational database with uh, a, a spreadsheet application. And as I mentioned before, we looked at PowerPoint, not PowerPoint, pardon me, <laughs> pivot tables and how we can take pivot tables and we can mix and match variables in a very intuitive way, put them in a column, put them in a row, uh, change formatting of numbers, but it allows us to see that analytical cube that we've talked about uh, throughout, the, I mentioned at the start of the course, so we can take that data and kind of shift it and look at it in some different ways. But in able to do that, to get it up to an application, we one, have to have the data Two, we've got to have it stored and handled properly. And three, we've got to retrieve it, i.e. extract it. So we're going to put our feet in the water, and it's the same kind of process that we went through before. Now, the textbook is going to be the Lambert textbook, okay? And this is an excellent textbook. If you want a step-by-step-by-step-by-step -by -step -by -step -by -step explanation with a case, with screenshots, and all of that, you're welcome to do that and to use it. I'll talk through it and uh, and give some give uh, some insights as far as what we're really looking at. Now, in addition, I'll have, as I did with Excel, some old cases that I've had around and that I've tweaked and used, etc. Now, I would say this. This is just for for everybody who hears the recording and or, or who's here now for the live stream. When you go out and go into the job market, you're going to have people who, everybody in the world is going to be, as a business student, and a lot of non-business people are going to be very, very proficient at Excel. 
they're going to be proficient at spreadsheets because that was the tool uh, of the trade. Now, experience with a database system and understanding it or having a pre preliminary understanding of it will help you use the dashboard products that will be out there when you're out at work. More importantly, what we do is we give you the ability to have an intelligent conversation with the IT people so you can get uh, their assistance and you can get the data that you want to work with. Now, I've worked with databases ever since, I guess, probably the first commercial products came out. I even worked with some before there were any commercial products and they were and they were they were heavily there was there were no, there were no icons there were no drop down menus everything was programming and then early on we saw some commercial products emerge access for example which you should have there and open is is kind of the template or the progenitor for all of the different databases that are out there, the commercial products that are used today. So if you have a good understanding of how access works, you have a great understanding of how database works. Okay? And it's not that foreboding. Now, as a decision maker, uh, you'll be interacting with these as you begin to as you begin to move up the ladder and you be and you become someone who are, starts to ask some important questions. What do I need to know every day? What do I need to know every week? What do I need to know every month? What do I need to know every quarter, every six months, every year, every five years? And this is this issue of what we call key performance indicators and also an idea, an issue what we call query discipline. And I might have shared it with you and I have with, with, other, with other classes getting companies or organizations to calendarize their collection and their extraction activities is very, very difficult. But if you don't do it, you won't get the benefit of doing it. it that's really all there is to it. So we're gonna look at that. Now, as, been, as has been the case, I have a, there's an Excel file over there in Canvas. There's one after every single module that shows you the resources that we'll be using for the Microsoft Access cases, and there are two. One of them is one of these old cases I worked with. It's called the company Northampton Embraces, and that's, uh, it's the ACCDB1 uh, in the files section there in Canvas, okay? And we're going to talk about creating a sales support system and data table creation. And then there is a case from the companion files for the Lambert text. This is the Lambert and Cox text. It's called Garden 01. So I'm following the same pattern that I did before. Now I want to take a moment and talk a bit about the this textbook. The Lambert textbook, again, gives you step by step by step with screenshots. So if you want to take the garden case, for example, and take a look at how we put together tables and so forth, they're going to walk you through that process. As I mentioned on Tuesday, every database has four things, at least four. It has a form, a way that we input data into the tables. Two, it has tables where we store data. Three, it has what we call a query engine, a way to extract the data out. And you're gonna hear that as you go out to work like data warehouses, data marts. Um, the analogy that people tried to do in business is to put together, is to, is to say, okay, I've got all these data, all these bits of stuff, and I got to collect it and I've got to store it in the most efficient way possible. Now, the cost of storing data at a certain level start to start to approach almost nearly zero. And then the costs begin to go back up. It's a, uh, it, 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 it's, 
it's just like any other marginal cost. It goes down and hits an optimal point or a near zero point, and then it starts to shoot back up the more you collect. So when you talk about big, really big companies, you're talking about a lot of money. And also, if you talk about folks running queries using dashboards, investing their time in, in looking at those, you're gonna, and as we look like at trade winds, Northwind, Northwind traders, um, you could see we had a little dashboard there that we clicked on the KPIs because it was a sales organization. So here's the, uh, we'll go over to the introduction for just a minute. You'll, they'll walk you through and they've got the practice files, okay? And they'll tell you about it. They identify each one of them. And we're gonna do six cases that will get us, let us get our feet wet in working with, with, with databases. And all I can tell you is having, when you go out and apply for a job and, and you can say to an employer, I've worked with Access, I've worked with SQL, I've worked with Oracle, uh, I've worked with SAP, I've worked with SAS, which are all of the major products and the command and control language for most databases derives itself from SQL. You're far ahead of the curve and that gives you a skill level that is far, far above just about any other business students who are out there. Well, all that being said, we're gonna take a look today at a, a case, and we're gonna look at Northampton Abrasives. Okay, so you'll wanna get that, and that's the ACCDB1 case, and I've got it stored here on my machine. You can go over there and get it in the files. And again, that's that resources file that says, okay, what am I gonna be using? And it deals with that company, North, Ham North Hampton. I think I may have it also in the welcome module, okay? So you'll wanna take a look at that. And then we'll talk some about Garden uh, 01, which is the case out of the Lambert and Cox text. And let me see if I've got it here. I'm pretty sure I do. Here it is the ACD, ACCDB1, and that deals with this company called Northampton Embraces. And where did I put you on the desktop here? I will find you, my friend. There you are. I'm gonna open up Northampton, and you'll wanna download it, and, and you're gonna have to go ahead in the modules to find where you'll want, where you'll need to be uploading these for the workshop credit. So you'll want to be mindful of that. So you'll have to go on down to the later modules. Well, let's look at this at this at this case because the first step we taught we we work we work with excuse me is building tables. Okay. Now, typically, well, almost always we use a thing called a form. Let me show you a form. You're very familiar with it. You've used it and you don't even know it was a form. It's called this. I go to Google, it shows you my sites that I'm using, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a form. Why? Well, I'm going to input, I'm gonna do a query and it's up here if I put in a uniform resource locator, or here if I just do a free text search, and Google is gonna go and find that data for me and, and put it in some type of order, and the more that I search for a particular site, it's even gonna do something like giving me icons to shorten the process. I didn't create those icons, Google did because it's counted the number of times in the past year that I've went to those sites or used them, and okay, this is where he likes to go a lot. Let's make it easy for him, okay? A form is a way I input data into a table. Now, what most folks don't understand about Google is that when the first thing that happens with Google, now this is all lightning speed because they've got an incredible algorithm that they've developed, and such high speed computing, it's almost scary. It fills, 
it, while, it, while I come and say, okay, I want to find something about X, Y, or Z, it builds that into a table, and then it indexes all of those records. So it has records of me of when I searched the day, the time, what I chose, et cetera. And that's how it starts to, to it engages in what we call unsupervised machine learning because I don't know it, but I'm training Google. Google's stupid. Google will do what I tell it to do. And it will only do what I tell it to do. And it will only search for what I search for. And it, it will, it, now it's, it does know how to spell because if I put some things in there misspell and you know this, you'll start to get these little drop down menus and these little choices that you've got. So Amazon, here's another one. Amazon is not only uh, a, a data, Amazon has a form right here. Amazon utilizes what we call a recommendation engine where they just uh, are such good people that they wanna make sure I know what I wanna buy. All right, isn't that nice of them? They're good people, nice people. And they wanna make sure that, well, hey, maybe I want home security. Now, they've got my wife's, they've got my wife go over here and she's got 10 items in the cart Lord knows it was probably some poison for me, who knows. But you notice we're getting these little flow throughs on these banners. Why? Well, she looks like she may be wanting to buy something of that nature, who knows, okay? So, and notice they tell her, shop women run businesses. They're recommending, hey, Julie, Julianne, you are a female, buy from women. Okay, I'm good with that. Then she's got her orders and try prime and all this business. So your phone is a database. When you press an app on your phone to use it, you go into a database. Now, um, YouTube obviously is one of my favorites. You say, how do, you, how, can you, how do we know that? Well, I can look and see, notice here, They've got a little YouTube icon for me because I like to look at YouTube. I don't know how I lived without YouTube. I don't know how I lived without Google. My wife and I are big fans of old classic movies, and I can guarantee you that when we're watching a movie, we'll see a person or a name, and I'll go, is that person dead? <laughs> and so we do a lot of these ghoulish searches. They probably think we're undertakers or something. I don't know. But we – use that database just to find out. And I'll often ask her, how do we watch television or how do we watch sports without, without having this? How do we do that? Um, so databases are they're everywhere. They're extremely sequenced and they're very powerful. And they're a tool that we can use to do two things, three things. One, improve our internal operations okay, our internal transactions, to look at and improve and understand our transactions with our key constituents, usually customers, and number three, collect and analyze data about the world that's out there. Well, let's take a look at, pardon me, at Northampton, okay, and we're gonna see, and just again, the navigation through here, you'll notice at the top, you'll see the ribbon, Looks a lot like Excel, looks a lot like Word, looks a lot like PowerPoint. It looks like most, you'll either have a ribbon on the side or you have a ribbon on the top. Then if you choose to, you, you have the tabs and then you can start to drill down and it has what we call a tree system where you drill down and you choose the format or whatever it is you want to do, okay? Now, the shutter bar over here shows us the four basic objects that are in a database. Now, if you took 1103 with this, I'm hoping and praying that someone talked about object-oriented programming, okay? You say, what, what do you mean? Object-oriented programming means I have a thing, I have an icon, okay? And I can click and I can do any one of a number of things with that table, but I don't have to run a program to find it. It's there as an icon, as an object. Same story with all of these, 
tools and tasks and things that I can do. Well, let's start, let's take a, let's take a few minutes and let's look at the, at the table. And this is Northampton, okay? And I'm gonna scoot the uh, shutter back. And here we have the, the uh, table for Northampton. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull this out just a little bit more if I can. Yeah, we'll work through it. Let's look at what we've got going on here. I have a company number, some, a company ID, and then I have the name of the company, I have the address, I have the city, I have the state, I have the zip code, I have the last and the first name of the person who is our contact person there, I know what department they're in, I know the last time they, they placed an order from me, so, if I look at this table, I've got a number of elements that I call dimension elements and fact elements. You so say, what do you mean? Well, here's a fact. The last time that this company ordered from us was on the 8th of February, 28th of February, 2009. That's a fact. The rest of these are what we call dimensions variables, characteristics. Then we have this also, we have this, this, uh, this set of serial numbers that are here for the company ID. And it's, the company ID is meant to maintain what we call referential integrity. And we'll talk about that some as we move on along. Okay, but I got a table here. This tells me everything about my customers, the, the, the companies, when they last ordered, everything about them, um, the first and last name of our contact people, all that business. Okay, and this table is updated, and it may be, and, and, and it will probably be updated by my customers, or if I'm, if I'm still kind of operating a, you know, a, a call in kind of system or something like that, I'm gonna use a form to input the data that will update the table. Let me show you what I'm talking about. And we'll, no, and we'll go back over here to the navigation pane. Here's the form. Okay. And this is, this is the form for table one. And let's say you, let's say that, you're a, you operate a call center and people are calling in or are coming in and using a chat function to get help on a technical problem or order a product or whatever. Well, if somebody, if, if, if somebody, let's say that you're, you're having it, let's say you're getting your, you're, you're going at, you're going to get a new a mortgage. You're going to buy a home. You want to get a mortgage from rocket loans. You're going to call a rocket. You're going to put in some data for rocket loans, and then they're going to call you as fast as you put the data in. Why? Because like everybody, they're chasing customers, and based on the data they've had, they'll be able to say, "Well, hi, Susan, how are you today?" And they may even have a section here for notes. Susan likes dogs or Susan hates cats, or Susan is a New York Yankees fan, and she is, she's a blessed person. Or maybe a Cardinal, which fan, you say, it was Cardinal fan, which means she's been saved, okay? All others, I don't know, I pray for them. But with this type of data, you can personalize the conversation, and many times in call-in centers, they'll be sitting there with the data in this form with a script and they'll just go through the script. Why? Time is money, and the more calls that they take, uh, the more people that they get processed through rocket mortgage, rocket loans, the more money they make. And uh, just for kicks, my wife and I, we bought our house a couple of years ago, or, or we bought a new house a couple of years ago. We just said, let's do, let's do rocket loans. I just want to see how, how good they really are. Because back in the day, it's been a long time ago since I went through a loan process. Uh, I had to go to the loan company. 
I had to take all this paperwork. I had to give them all this stuff. Oh my goodness gracious. And it was excruciating. And then I had to, you know, have someone come out and look around that, go and look at the house and inspect it and all that stuff and all the paperwork they had to get from the county and all these things. It was just drug on and on and on. We decided to see, to go through the, all the way through the process of rocket loans, and they had us a loan and a lender, everything ready to go within six days. I was going, whoa. Whereas it used to take a month and a half, two months, three months. The first house I ever uh, bought, I, I built it, and I sold it before I ever lived in it. But the uh, I went through the loan process, and it was almost a five-month process. So this form allows me to update data if I want to. It allows me to put in new customers. It allows me to look at current customers. And so the form is an object which is really essential or key where I collect data. When you swipe your ATM card, you're putting that data into a form. If I go to Walmart and I buy something, they have all my data. They know what time I bought all the stuff I bought. They know what I bought. They have all of it there. And they collect it so that someday if I'm curious, I can go back and find out. They would never ever use it to sell me more stuff. Think again. And if you ever get a Walmart card, you will permanently be looking at Walmart banner ads or side ban ads for the rest of your life and getting email updates for the rest of your life. And that's how they do cross selling and encourage more selling, et cetera. But when you put in that credit card and you swipe it or your debit card, all the data that's there gets captured and it gets stored. And then if you haven't read carefully, which most of us don't when you get your phone, uh, your phone company, the phone company says, hey, I can sell all of your data if I want to. Does anybody want to? And that's a bonanza for them because suddenly people know your purchasing patterns, they know your habits, etc. Let me show you one other interesting kind of thing that you can do with your phone. Now, I have an Android phone. And let's see, I don't wanna do that one. I want to, here we go. Maps. Okay. There are some good pieces of this and there are some creepy parts of this. All right. My phone, I have an Android phone, and unless I turn off the GPS locator, it will track everywhere I go. Why would I want the GPS on? Well, if I'm checking in at my favorite restaurant, and I want to tell everybody, hey, I'm over here, I'm having a big time. Okay. It'll locate me. I can, on this little section, I'm gonna go over here, and you'll see, and the, the worst part about this is you can see how sad your life really is <laughs> tracking your timeline. And here I am. And let's look at me today. Let's see if I've been to the stop by the casino on my way to work. Here we are. What a good boy I am. I just went straight to work. Straight from where I live, all the way over here to Bailey Business Center. Now, here's another interesting thing if I want to do this. Watch this. I can click show raw data and it will show me my data points. The time I was there. And it's accurate up to about 100 feet, which is just incredible. Now, if I want, I can export these data and there's a little, a, a a little thing here that says export this data this day to KML. KML are, are special files and you can go on the web and for free you can take those KML files and convert them over to, to GPS coordinates. So you can be very precise. In other words, I can fill in the dots. But aren't I good? 
I came right to work. Well, all that location data that's out there, hey, people want to know about it, and people are, people are rightfully concerned. Governments use these to track people. Uh, we know that law enforcement uses them. And one of these battles that they continually have with the phone companies is we've got this person, we think they're a bad person and we need to know where they're going. Or we think they're a bad person. Can we get all of their phone calls to Yemen for the last two months? Do they make any phone calls to Yemen? Yeah, they're calling Yemen about five times a day. Is that a problem? Well, if they're here on a visa, you may want to go talk to them. You may want to go talk to them. So we've had these kinds of issues around privacy and all this business. And I'll just close that off. But, you know, if you don't want someone to be able, like mama and daddy or whoever, to track you, it's simple. Turn off your GPS. Of course, you won't be able to locate yourself or tell your buds, hey, I'm on Facebook, I'm over here, at the, you know, wherever. But, and you can also see, this is intended for you to be able to see, well, what do I do every day? Well, that's supposedly what it was for. All right. So we've got the form, and we've talked quite a bit about it. And we can create a form, all right? And I'm going to show you how we would do that. I'm going to click on Create. All right. And then you'll see I've got a form design or a form wizard I've tried, I've written Microsoft and emailed and called them repeatedly. I don't like, I've asked them to take the word wizard out of this because I think it implies something about devil worship or maybe the occult. They've refused, they have, well, uh, once they issued the restraining order, I couldn't contact them anymore. But we have the form wizard and I can open this form wizard up and it will tell me, okay, what table or query do I want to choose and what do, what, and what type of form do I use? And there's just, it's all a very intuitive process. And it will give me a nice looking little form that tells, and I can pull it from a table or from a company. Okay. Now, let's talk about the table. Now let's go back here to the Northampton table and we'll push the shutter aside. And what I'd like you to do is right click on that, on that form. Okay. In fact, go to the click home, click the home tab and look in the far left corner and you're going to see a little thing that looks like a slide rule or design. That's a view that we can get of the table of its design. And one of the things that we can do if we have that axe, if we have the, the, the power to do so is look at a database in all of its different levels, okay? And here we can look at the design level. So click on that, and you can either do it on the tab or here. And we'll click on it. And here we have what Oracle also calls this the data dictionary. This is really the heart of everything. Let's look at what we've got here. We have company ID, company address, city, state, zip, etc. okay? Now, I have to name these fields, fair enough. Then I have to say, okay, what data type do I want? Now, you're not database administrators and you never will be, but this becomes important for two reasons. Number one, when I extract data, what will I get and what will it look like? And number two, how much is it gonna cost me to store all of this? If I have 10,000 or 20,000 records, eh, when I start to hit a million records, it becomes real money. And it's also more importantly an issue of when I run a query, what will I get? Okay, so we've got the table and we can choose the data type. We have some series of choices. And here in the company ID, we've put, we were using a number and it uses a long digiter digit long integer excuse me and the decimal places are automatic and it is required and notice it says yes no duplicates i cannot have identical records it prevents me from having two or three more than one entry for my customer for that particular company 
for that particular ID. Okay? And this starts to begin the thing that we call referential, referential integrity that allows me to make sure that the table has all original records, nothing duplicated. Now, you'll notice that this is down here in, in the general properties, and we have no we don't we have no duplicates. So if I try to put in a duplicate number, I'm going to have a problem. Then. The next step I'm going to do is I have the company and notice I've got short text and I have a field size of 255 bits characters that I can put in there for the name of the company. That may be too much, but now if you notice over here, you'll see this thing that says description optional. If you were working for me and, and, and you, and we were, we were in charge of a database and I opened the database up and you didn't have a description in there of what that's supposed to be and when you entered it and all that. Um, we're going to have a very, very interesting meeting. And one of the things this is, uh, Microsoft doesn't, pro doesn't provide us you know, with this, they don't provide us maybe some fake data in here, but in the real world, you'll want to know, what exactly do we mean by this? Okay. Who entered it and what date did they enter it? Because we need those records to know. And then we come down and we've got the, the address. Okay. And then we have the city and we have the state. Now, I bet you anything that I could take any person in here and if I ask you to spell Mississippi consistently, um, lots of some others. Uh, Mississippi is one, um, one of those states, uh, Mississippi probably the best one. And he'd say, why wouldn't you just put in the two, two, uh, the two letter designator for each of those? And so you'd probably want to have a, 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 what we call a lookup table that would have the state, the two codes and would explain which one is which. Arkansas, Alaska, Alabama, have I missed any? And there's A-L, A-R, A-K. O-K is Oklahoma, M-O is Missouri, M-N is Minnesota. Is it Minnesota or is it Montana? Or is Montana M-T? We want to have a lookup table so we have just a little drop down menu so the person inputting the data, boom has a choice and they put it in a format with it all spelled out or left a chance, we may have some problems. Let's look at the zip code here. Now we can use a thing here if we want called an input mask. And if you go down here and you take a look at the field properties, click on that one, two, three, fourth, third, the third line there and you'll see the three, do, three dots and click on that. We can customize how we store the zip code data. And when we choose a particular format, it has to be inputted in that way. Okay? Now, if you're lucky, 95% of the data entry through forms for your company will, will, be, will be done, say, via a phone or something of that nature and or, or, so it will be automated, or it will be inputted by a responsible party. But you may be in a place where the people who input the data into the form, okay, uh, are simply just clerks or folks putting data into a form. A pretty tedious way to live, but they're out there, okay? And if you come in and they've had yeah, one too many Red Bulls that morning after a weekend with one too many domestic disturbances, they may just decide to put anything in there in any format. And then you've got junk. So you want to make that standardized. So you choose an input mask that forces the data to be input in a, in a form that's acceptable to you and makes sense. It's not a free floating kind of thing. Let's go back to the state for a minute and We'll click on it. 
And notice something, it is 255 characters. So you may run a report and without some uniformity there, if you don't use say a drop, like a drop down menu from a, a table it would call, you could have a table there, you would have a table there called state abbreviations and you'd have the abbreviation and then the name of the state, okay? And that would control uh, that input so that it would, you'd be using the correct two character designation for the state and saving a lot of problems. Zip code, again, you could control how that's input. But we want to make sure, one, that we've got referential integrity, which the company ID allows us to do. And number two, that we have our data stored in a format that's easily easy for us to extract and that we have the data entered in a uniform fashion. And that we have the data entered. I probably mentioned this when we talked about the, uh, the when we talked about Northwind, Northwind Traders, if you have folks, especially in, unfortunately volunteers who are inputting data on say a card or even worse into a kiosk and they just decide to skip some data, then you get a report and it has all of these anomalies. It has all of this missing data and you get what we call the problem of a null value. Null means nothing. It's not the same as zero and a null could mean they forgot, the person refused, who knows, but you've got junk. I worked with the church on their database. They had a new visitor, uh, new visitor slip. These are people who visited for the first time and it had 43 items and they fed them into a table and none of those items were required. So there was no, there was no discipline in terms of input and they were using a kiosk and it was a nightmare, nightmare for the people there trying to figure out what have I got? And I said, what, at the end I said, you have Jack. So you've got to force things to be input in a particular way. And there was an uncomfortable meeting for all of them, but if you're going to, I said, finally, if you're going to, if you're going to turn out this much junk, okay, then quit collecting visitor cards or just get the stuff that the visitor will give you and, and, and stop it at just contact data. And what was amazing to me was the, the most frequent, the, the item for their card that was the one, the item that was not input, the one that was number one in terms of having no value was, I'm interested in someone coming to see me. <laughs> That's wonderful. <laughs> and so I showed them the report and I said, how many people, and they had about 150 visitors that Sunday. And I said, of these 150 people, how many of them want you to come see them? The room got quiet. And I said, well, let's just do this. Let's just go see them. Well, we might annoy them. We might upset them. Well, okay, but they came to see us, didn't they? Yeah. And they said, well, what if we just try to collect more data on them next week if they come back? And as I said, so you're going to have a visitor card and a revisitor's card to fill out. One of the things about business that's pretty amazing is it's, it's deceptively easy. It looks like anybody can do it. That's not true. But it does require some simplistic disciplines, and one of them is discipline in, in terms of data input. And if you're, if you're a sales organization, any organization, and you don't have tables that have referential integrity, that don't have control of how data are inputted, et cetera, you're going to have a mess, a big mess on your hands. Because when you go to run reports, you're not going to be able to do that. Let's close this table off for a minute. And I'll, I'll, we'll take a look at another one of these critters, and we'll open up the navigation pane. And we're going to go down to the queries. Now, query is a, is a real simple, it's a fancy way 
to say a question. Now here's one that's called Kansas City Clients. These are the people who are in Kansas City who are clients of this company. So we have the name of the company, we have the last name and the first name and the title of that person. Now we probably would wanna have some other things like their phone number and how to contact them. And you ought to have that if you're gonna be heading over to Kansas City to go see them, okay? Or to give them a phone call and go, how's everything going, etc." Now this is a nice, nice query. It's very pretty and it's very well done. Click on the design tab up there in the far left corner. And you're gonna go down to the design area and we'll open this back up. And the design area shows you the table that we're using. It shows you the fields, i.e. the columns from that table that we're gonna collect data from. And then we have a criteria line. You see the line called criteria. And here we say, Kansas City, here I come. Okay, is there something missing from this that allows me to do more than look at their names and go, well, that, that, what a beautiful name. That person has a wonderful first name. Wow, that's cool. What a great name for a company. Is there anything missing? Well, there is. And it's this. We want to look at their order pattern. And let's pull that over here. Now, if you see the check marks here in these boxes, that's where we can suppress data if we want to. So on the records here, when we get the output, we don't want Kansas City cans. I can make sure everybody knows it's about Kansas City by titling the query, Kansas City Clients. Got me? So let's look at it up here and let's run it. And, and yeah, one of my favorite movies uh, is that, it, it, well, it's just one of the great movies ever made. And it's about this guy from Alabama who runs everywhere and he goes to Vietnam and he owns a shrimp company. Anybody know what that movie is about? Can anyone tell me? What's the name of the movie? Forrest Gump, exactly. So in honor of Forrest, when I run a query, I go, run, Forrest, run. We run the query. I've me I memorized a lot of dialogue from that movie. One of them is at the, uh, they're at the, at the, uh, at the waiting, at the reflecting pool in front of the uh, Lincoln Memorial when she's waiting through it going, Forrest, he goes, Jenny, Forrest, Jenny. Okay. One of the great movies. So I, Forrest Gump's a great movie. All right. Now I have something I can make a decision about. Notice what I've got. I've got an order pattern. Okay. So if the order pattern, and I don't know what that I and S is supposed to mean, it's not very descriptive. I think I means that it's increasing. I think S means that it's stable. But I've got information now. Before I or added this tape, before I added this column, I had data, but there was nothing to make a decision about. But now, if I say who should I call first, well, if I means it's it, it, it's it's going if it's increasing, I want to go see those people to make sure they're happy and, and can we get some more sales from them, etc. And I don't know what that order pattern means, and. Let's click on order pattern in that table and we can see what they're talking about. And one is decreasing, increasing, stable. Okay. So now I have a query that gives me information. I can make a decision about who I want to go see in Kansas City, who I probably need to contact. And this is a judgment call because I've got to ask myself, okay, do I want to go see the people over here who we have increasing sales or do I, do I, and try to get some more sales or make sure that they, their sales continue to increase? Or do I want to go see the people here who have a stable order pattern? Is it possible that we can get some more business from them? 
or go by and say thank you for your business with all of these people. That's going to be up to you and your experience base and dealing with these folks. Because now I have some information. That makes sense? So I've got this, this Kansas City clients create. Now, here's one of the things that, that's, that's really incredible about databases and queries. When we run a query, when we create a table, okay, we reserve space in the machine's memory. We take up some space there. We take up literal physical space. And in the old days, when we first were doing working with databases, we had to do a lot of programming that would say we would use pointers, which would say go to this address in the computer's memory or its storage banks to get this cell, and we'd have to go through all of this stuff to run a query. And we had to be careful because if we weren't, we could actually change the table and suddenly this table, which is really what we call legacy data, becomes this unstable thing that we've messed up. Well, thankfully, when we went, we went to object-oriented programming, we're able to run a query, but a query is really just a, snap, is a snapshot of a table. And then we, like Photoshop, we crop the thing, we add in whatever we do, so we edit the photo. And this is really nothing more, okay, than just a picture. It's not the actual data. And because of that, I can run thousands and tens of thousands of queries from the same set of tables and harvest an incredible amount of insight. That's the thing that makes these such a great tool and, and, why, and, and why they have become such an important part uh, of why they become such an important tool for companies and why they're so important for you to understand. Uh, so I've got a picture here and you say, okay, well, what gets stored? Well, I'll show you what gets stored. Right click or go over here to the top and let's go down to the SQL view, the SQL. There's the code. Trust me, SQL is very easy to write and to work with. It's a command language. And you basically tell the machine, well, I want to get, where do I get it from? And maybe I'm going to do some manipulation. Uh, maybe some, I might, uh, I might do some computational work, but, but here I've said, okay, I'm going to get all these fields from this, from this table and anywhere that the table says Kansas city. And this is the where, statement right here at the very end. And I use Boolean logic where table city equals Kansas City. And you could take this apart and within a couple of weeks or sooner, you'd be inputting query data. So you've got this view, this is what gets saved. And then if I run it, I get the result set also, also known as the view, okay? Now, the value of what we've got here, let's talk about that for a moment. I've got my list of Kansas City clients, and I've got the order pattern, and so I want to do one other thing. I'm, I'm going to go to Kansas City, but before I do, I'm going to give them a buzz, all right? So I'm, I've got the, I'm going to get their first name, last name, their title, and I'm going to look for a phone number. And do we have one? City, state, title. Do we have a phone number for these people? Whoops. Last order. Oh, no phone. Well, I'm going to go back up here to this, this table and open it up, okay? And do I see a phone number in there? Got their last order, their city, their state, their zip. Well, we don't have a phone number. I don't see one. Does anybody see a phone number or an email? Well, now we've got a problem because if we want to contact these people, 
we're out of luck. So now I'm going to have to collect some more data on how to contact them. And that would probably be another whole table. But at least I've, I've got a battle plan in terms of who I want to go see. And let's take a look at the last order and let's pull it over here. So, and you can just do a drag and drop environment or you can use the, the, the little uh, tree bars there, just the menu bars. And we'll take a look at this. And we'll go back up to the view and their last orders. Now, if I want to up here, in the view, I can say, all right, I'm gonna put that as last orders and I'm gonna sort them in oldest to newest. Why? I wanna find out the last, how old some of these orders are. So if I've got somebody that's really not, it's been a while, I wanna contact them and see what's going on. Right now, you know 90% you know more about a database and why we have them and why we use them than 90% of the people out in business. Businesses are just now starting to kind of understand, wow, that thing's pretty powerful. Again, when you go out to work, you may not have all of the privilege that we're going to, here when we're using access, we can do anything in this database. So we're the master of this little universe. You go out to work, you'll probably have some limitations put on what you can do, especially data input with tables. And you'll probably be limited to a set of queries, just like we saw with the dashboard over there for Northwind Traders. Okay. Now I'm going to close this. Well, before I do, I'm going to I'm going to plummet one more time. And I've got the order pattern, the last time they ordered, and I'm going to get the product group. And I'm going to take a look at it. Okay. Now I'm going to move the their title and I'm going to squinch that over. I'll just close the shutter there on, on the objects. And now I have the product group. Okay. And I can see, is there a particular product group? where things are stable or not. The one that's increasing is G. But if I look here, I've got a product group S that shows up two out of four times. So I need to stop back and I'll probably know what that is. All right. Or I'll have a table if, I, if, we, if we're handling a lot of products, et cetera, that I can go look it up. But two of these four, they're holding their own, they're stable. This gives us a sense of maybe what's happening in terms of the market. The product group G, it's increasing, so that's some more insight. So just from this one query, I have lots I can be, I can be thinking about. Now, we'll go ahead and move the navigation pane back and I have a task, I'd had a thing called task five and task six. Let's take a look at that and we'll open it up. I will close the shutter bar and here we go. We're interested in finding out the aging of our orders just like receivables can go old, like we talked about when we did that case involving the co that collection, ordering can go old. A customer can just stop ordering from us and we wanna find out why, okay? So we've got the data to contact these, we have their names except for we need some more data, but we've got the last order. So if we want to, now we're in a position where we can sort from the oldest to the newest. Okay, now if I wanted to do some work with these data, let's say I also had, for example, the amount of the order and a, a particular product, etc. I'm gonna take this, this table and I'm gonna, this, this query and I'm gonna export it. So let's click on the navigation pane 
and then right click on task five and you'll see it says export. I can export this to Excel where I can do some computational work and I can do some visualization. I can use a pivot table or I could do some charting, things of that nature. As I said, some of the newer, the products, most, most especially SAS Visual Analytics, which in my opinion is the best one out there, will let me, let's, let's, let's me have the best of both worlds. I pull data from a table and then I can have some choices in terms of the chart that I want, do I want to show the data with the chart, et cetera. It's a fantastic tool. And folks that use it are pretty smart because otherwise you start to rely on some, maybe some lesser quality products or a lot of homegrown stuff. But you notice here I can import this out to Excel and then I could do some work with it. So that's also one of the things about queries is that they're exportable. I can take them and put them into another environment where I can work with them. Or I can import them into a database. Okay. Now, I want to show you something of some, some practical value that helps you understand why databases are also an important thing and is as far regarding a database. Let me show you one. It's a place called Hulu. Now, the people at Hulu understand something very important. They understand that the value of any product has not only the product itself, which is we call its stock quality, but it also has a flow, meaning how easily can I distribute it to be put out for sale? How easily can I fulfill the order? Now, what does Hulu sell? Do they sell cars? Do they sell shirts? Do they sell guns? Do they sell shoes? What do they sell? Entertainment, they sell experiences. You watch a documentary, you watch a movie, and they stream it to you. They understand that flow portion where you wanna watch it on your phone, etc. The other night, my, my, wife, my wife and I, who are uh, Cardinal fans, she grew up there, so she's a true believer. I lived up there for 22 years, and I finally gave up and just said, okay, I'll support them too, although I am, in my heart, a Yankee fan, but I'm a Cardinal fan now too. But the other night, she's very frustrated because we couldn't find the Cardinal game on cable. So I said, well, go to your phone and take a look at Fox Sports Go. Don't we have that? And suddenly, I'm streaming the game to my TV, just as if I'm working looking at cable. And so I said, well, there's another one of those checkmark moments where we go, it's going to get in time to dump cable. If I didn't get it so cheap, I, I would have said goodbye to it long ago. But it, it reinforced for me that the folks at Fox Sports, they get it. They understand I want to see them play. They're going to find a way to stream that to me and to flow it to me. If I want to see a movie, I can do the same thing with Hulu. And you've got Netflix and you've got YouTube. And you have all these networks, the big networks, have their own sites where you can stream stuff. Now, one of them that's a really amazing story, and I may have told you about this before. If not, I won't apologize because it's a lesson, is this place. Okay. Turner Classic Movies. Now, this is an interesting company. And I like to share these applications and things, but I also like to show you some of the business sense that goes along with this. Turner Classic Movies is a set of movies that were purchased by Ted Turner back in the early 90s. Back in the early 90s, the big studios were going out of business. And so, 
Turner was one of those people who said, hey, MGM's selling all their old films and all their own props because they're closing it down. The Dream Factory is coming to a close. He went over and bought a bunch of their movies. He got the rights to those movies. He bought movies from Paramount. All of those great, great studios that produce, produced so many iconic movies. And they were a factory. Hollywood was called a dream factory. If you went to a studio, I remember as a young kid, we went over to see MGM and went through a tour. And it was like a studio. They were shooting about a dozen movies at, the, at that time. And you had all these people were doing makeup and all this activity going around. My dad said, this is a factory. But when you and I see it, it's not a factory, is it? We see, we experience, we have an emotional reaction, whatever. Well, he bought a whole bunch of catalog, catalog of all of these old movies. And he had the thing down there in Atlanta called the Super Channel. This is before any of you even remember this. It's called TBS now, but it was the Super Channel. And he went around to all the television stations in the United States, contacted him and said, look, I know that you end your day at midnight. Yeah. Does the government make you do that? No, we just don't have anything to show. And Ted said, well, have I got something for you? And that's when the late night movies came into being. And so he started showing them. And, and uh, then you had WGN, the Superstation out of Chicago. They show old movies. And one of the amazing things is the catalogs that he purchased, their value today is about 50 times greater than it was when he purchased them. We just sold movies. And then he has a whole lot of other things going on, restores, restoration projects, ways to make connections with people who are, who are users, who visit all this stuff, they run tours. A database. That's all it is. If you go to ESPN, it's a database. You can click on ESPN, go there and take a look. And here it is. And if you're a marketing major, and if you're really interested in marketing, you want to be successful, go take a look at what these folks have done. They allow me, using a form, to follow my favorite team, to get the scores, get the standings, get the interviews, get the videos. It's all there. And if I want to pay a little bit of extra money, I can watch stuff. That's all it is. ESPN is one of the great technology companies. When they first started, you would believe the stuff they showed. Now, I was one of the first people in, in Norman, Oklahoma to have cable. And I had a gigantic cable box about all, it was about four feet long, about three feet wide. And cable was on from eight o'clock at night till two o'clock in the morning. Eight o'clock, they'd have uh, comedy specials and documentaries, and then they had dirty movies, and then they called it a night. Well, ESPN came along and said, you know, we'd like to, we just want to broadcast some regional games up here in New England. We're, we're, we're up here in New England, and we'd like to show some. And the people at the satellite company said, why would you do that when for the same price you can beam this all over the world? And ESPN was born. And they started saying, okay, we're gonna cover every single sport we can. You're looking at a database. Powerful, powerful stuff. Well, let's go back in and, and take a look again at this database. And we have, we've looked at forms, we've looked at queries, and now we have a report. Let's look at it. And so this is a, a report from the Northampton, Northampton table. The report function Excel and access, I hate it, I don't like it. So they're decent, but not that great. Right. Now, one of the things 
that I want to make sure that we do also is this. I want to take just a, a little bit of time to talk about garden one, which is that which is that case out of the Lambert and Cox text. Okay. And what they're going to do here, and we'll just put it on the desktop. Okay, I'll close this off, and here we are. And I can say this, it's in read-only format, but you can see it's got the tables, etc. Now, I want to go back over to Vital Source, and I want to show you here. Um, take a look at this for just a second. Okay, and we'll take a look at the pages because there are particular pages here in that text that we're going to, that we're going to be using. So let me open that up and the pages 28 through 43. You'll want to take a look at them at the garden case. Okay. And so we'll take a look at chapter, chapter one and the simple databases. And we'll see they walk us through exploring tables and they give you step by step and they even show you here something interesting and that is how to link queries. You've heard me term, use the term referential integrity. Okay. If you look right here and you see this query, notice that they're linked. When I can link tables, when I can link queries, I can start to leverage the law of large numbers. It's that simple. And if you look here, see I've got the category ID over in the categories table, and then notice I've got it linked to the category ID in the products table. So I can match these two tables up and harvest the data from both of them. There were actually the two queries. Okay. Um, and they also, she walks you through, the, the authors walk you through reports. So it's going to be worth your time to take a look at it and give it some time. Well, we started early today. And so I think we put in our time and I'm going to go ahead and, and shut it down and see if does anybody have a question I can try to uh, help them with at this point. And those of you who came in late, you can go back and see the start of the video once I've got it processed and uploaded. Anybody have a question? Yes? No? Okay, folks. I'm going to call it a day then. Thank you. And I'll be back online uh, Tuesday.